When I moved into this house a few months ago, I was in desperate need of a change of scenery. I spent the majority of my adult years since college living in a tiny one-bedroom apartment overlooking the busiest part of downtown Chicago. It was just a short walk to the station, and then from there, I could get to my office in under 20 minutes every morning. I enjoyed being around all my favorite food places and having access to anything that I needed within walking distance. But what ended up getting me tired was the constant noise that came with living in a highly populated urban area. Once I had decided that I was sick and tired of the lonely city life, I immediately started saving my money for the down payment on the house in the suburbs. Close enough that I could still drive to work, but far enough away from the city that I would likely never hear the police in the middle of the night ever again. Shortly after I had saved up what I considered to be a decent chunk of money, I found what I thought would be the perfect house for me. It was a little one-story model home that was in a subdivision that backs up to a forest wetland known as the Lava Woods for maximum privacy. I specifically chose a house at the very back of the neighborhood on a street that had only recently been developed. There was only two or three other finished houses on the road, but mine was the only one at the very end of the street, backing up to a densely wooded area. The moving process happened quickly, and before I knew it, I was moved into my new place. After a week or two, I had transitioned into the slower pace of the suburban life, and was surprised to realize that I had actually become somewhat lonely without neighbors in my area. I would often find myself taking long walks around the neighborhood, and I would sometimes wander around for an hour or two on my days off just to see other people walking their dogs or taking a stroll with their families. On this one day, I had taken one of my strolls and was turning down my street to make my way home. My attention was drawn to the sound of meowing coming from a bush off to the side of the road. I approached the bush and knelt down, shining the flashlight on my cell phone into the lower branches to see if I could pinpoint the source of the sound. The light reflected off two small eyes in the underbrush with a powerful meow. A small orange tabby cat came trotting out of the bush to greet me. I chuckled to myself and jokingly asked the cat where he had come from as he began to brush up against my legs. I knelt down, patting the little guy's ears and wondering if he had belonged to someone in the area. He was far too friendly and social to be a feral cat, so I assumed that he belonged to a family nearby. He was still fairly young, maybe a year old or so, but he didn't have a collar. So I picked them up in my arms and knocked on the door of the nearest houses, asking them if they had lost a cat. None of them had ever seen him before, so I decided to keep him at my house for the night. It was already pretty late, so I wouldn't be able to get him to a vet to check for a microchip until the next day. I gave him a bath by wiping him down with damp paper towels and fed him some of the lunch meat I had in my fridge. He made himself right at home in my house. And for the very first time since moving out here, I didn't feel quite as lonely. In fact, a part of me dreaded taking him to the vet in the morning and possibly finding out that he actually has a family that he would be needed to be returned to. But if it were my missing pet, I would want someone to let me know if they had found them. So I determined that no matter what, I would take him to the vet tomorrow morning and have them check for a microchip. For the rest of the evening, I enjoyed having the little guy curled up next to me on the couch while I caught up on reruns of Scrubs and ate my TV dinner. The next morning, I loaded him up in the car and took him to the nearest vet. I explained that I found him on the side of the road and that he seemed far too comfortable around humans to have been a feral cat. The vet agreed with me and began to scan him for a microchip. After about 30 seconds, she shook her head and informed me that he wasn't actually Chip. She explained that normally, people who want to dump their animals off will drop them off inside subdivisions, hoping that someone else will find them and take them in so that they don't have to be responsible for them anymore. The thought of someone just abandoning such a sweet animal broke my heart, and without even thinking, 
I asked the vet if it would be okay if I took him home, since he didn't have a microchip. She left and told me that as far as they were concerned, the cat already belonged to me. I thanked her and told her that I wanted to get all the shots done while I was here, and asked if I could pick out a collar and some food from the waiting room. She told me that I was welcome to and asked me what name to add to my little buddy's file. Almost instantly, I told her his name was Max. I didn't even have to think about it, and from the moment that I first laid eyes on him, I knew his name was going to be Max. After the vet finished his checkup and shot, they handed Max back to me in a cardboard cat carrier. I peeked inside of the box to see that they had put the collar on him that I had picked out. A small green collar with a bow tie and a bell right below his chin. I loaded all of Max's new belongings into the car and the two of us made our way home. The following weeks would be some of the happiest weeks of my life. Max preferred to spend his days outside when I was working, and then at the end of the day, I would come to the back door and see him coming out of the woods, ready to come inside and spend the night at the foot of my bed. We had a routine that we follow every single night, so it came as quite a surprise when a week or so ago, I came home to find Max already sitting at the back door, pacing back and forth, looking rather agitated. I turned the handle and he quickly pushed his way inside before I even had a chance to open the door all the way. His fur was standing on end and he ran past me down the hallway into my bedroom without even looking back, the bell on his collar jingling the whole time. I chuckled at his strange behavior. I figured that he had probably seen a deer or something in the woods and had gotten scared. I didn't think much of it until I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of him growling at the back door. When I turned on the light and made it to the end of the hallway, I could see the outline of Max's arched back and poofy fur as he stared out into the dark woods and continued to growl. I called out to him and tried to calm him down, flipping the switch by the door to turn on the lights outside to show him that nothing was there. His eyes remained fixed on the tree line as if he was seeing something deeper within the trees beyond my own sight. The sound of the bell on his collar jingling as he turned and sprinted back down the hallway to my bedroom. I knew that it wasn't unheard of to have a mountain lion or a coyote come through these less developed areas, and I figured that he had probably seen something further back than I had. I thought to myself that I should keep him inside for the next couple of days, just to be safe, you know. Then I turned and followed him back to the bedroom, closing the door behind me so that he wouldn't wander back to the back door and get himself worked up again. But I couldn't keep the bedroom door closed every night because his litter box was in the laundry room. So for the following few nights, I would find myself awoken to the familiar sound of Max being worked up and growling outside my bedroom. Each time, I would turn on the light to show him that there was nothing there and he would sprint back to the bedroom, his little bell jingling the entire way. After nearly an entire week of this behavior, I called the vet to see if I should bring him in for a visit. The vet told me that he had probably just had an encounter with a wild animal, and it had given him some anxiety, some anxiety about the woods behind my house. I agreed, and we continued with our routine. However, tonight, I woke up to the sound that I had become accustomed to of Max being worked up and growling outside my bedroom. I sighed and began to make my way out there to calm him down. So numb to the occurrence that I didn't even bother turning on the hallway light. Half awake, I rubbed my eyes and called out to Max, telling him that it was okay to come back to bed as I reached out for the switch to turn on the outside light. That's when I noticed that the back door was slightly open and it wasn't actually closed at all. My stomach dropped as I stared at the open door and then I snapped back into reality for a moment. Cold sweat broke out into my forehead as I recognized the familiar sound of Max's bell coming up from behind me in the darkened hallway, stricken with fear. I turned to see the familiar silhouette of Max's arched back and fluffy tail standing in the hallway behind me. I must have walked past him 
It didn't even take long for me to realize that I was still hearing the sound of Max growling. But this time, he wasn't staring at the back door. He was staring into the darkness of my bedroom. My throat closed as my heart pounded as my eyes adjusted to the darkness. And for the first time, I could see what Max was growling at all this time. Just beyond the doorway, standing off to the side of my bed, in the corner of my room, was the silhouette of a grotesque creature staring back down the hallway at me. Its limbs seemed to change in unnatural ways. Long stringy white hair clung to its scalp and beady black eyes locked with mine. Paralyzed, I heard the sound of Max's bell as he turned and began to run towards me in the back door. A sound that indicated that I should do the same. I turned and picked up Max in my arms as I ran out the back door, never looking back to see if I was being pursued. I ran down the road to the neighbor's house and I asked to use their phone to call the police. Sometime later, they came to investigate the house. They never found evidence of anyone inside, but they did confirm that the back door had been forced open by something outside. I don't know what to think about what happened to the two of us, but I think that starting today, Max and I are going to start to look for somewhere else to live. As a teenager, I would visit my grandma at her home on the Navajo Res for several weeks every summer. I love spending time with her, her delicious fried bread, and listening to her tell the stories. Every so often, my grandma would hire a worker, the harmless town drunk, to do jobs around her house and property. One evening, right before the sun went down, I was asked by my grandma to take him home which was about four miles out of the valley where she lived. I was more than happy to, seeing that I was only 14 years old and I was asked to drive a truck. Mind you, on the rest, nobody cares that you're only 14 years old and driving around. Rarely anyone is around to see you anyways. So my nine-year-old brother jumped in the truck cab with me while this worker and my dog shared the tailgate of the truck and then off we went. After I dropped the worker off at the shack that he and his brothers called the house, we headed back down the road to grandma's. As I mentioned before, it was evening and the sky was a deep red as the sun began to set behind us. We were leaving a nice dust trail from the dirt road and the radio was playing music from the only radio station that could be picked up from the nearest town. There was nothing strange, nothing weird. But it was at this time that I caught movement of something in the bushes, a little up the road to the right of us. I remember slowing down, thinking that it was one of the many free roaming sheep in the area that would sometimes dart out in front of the truck. As I passed where I thought I saw it, I sped up, thinking nothing else of it. Then, out of nowhere, I just felt this dark feeling of fear and dread. I had no idea why I was feeling this way but I definitely felt that something was wrong. Even now as I replay this memory in my mind, there's only a few clear memories that I have of that evening. I remember looking in my rear view mirror and seeing the dark silhouette of something very tall and very skinny that seemed to be covered with some kind of hair or fur running behind the truck after us. Whatever it was, it wasn't a normal human or even human at all. I remember hearing my brother crying and my dog barking at whatever was chasing us. I remember speeding very fast and shaking as the truck was bouncing on the dirt road. I remember that this thing was only getting closer as my brother cried out. It's coming up on your side. I remember being scared as hell and thinking that I didn't want to die at the moment that I thought would be our last. I remember speeding around a bend in the road and seeing a car coming towards us in the opposite direction. At that moment, I felt instant relief and felt that whatever was following us was gone. Shaken up, but alive, we made it to Grandma's house. Wondering what the hell had just happened, we ran inside, not looking back, 
hoping that whatever was chasing us had not followed us home. As we told my grandma about our experience, she didn't seem too surprised, which actually surprised us. She continued by repeating stories that we had already heard at one point, or another about black magic, witches, and something that the Navajos called Yinadroshi, or skinwalkers. Needless to say, I didn't even want to look out of any windows for the rest of the night. As a matter of fact, I never drove on the rest at night again until I was 21 years old. It all started around November of last year in Washington State, new to the area. I like the woods. So a few friends of mine decided to take me out to a secluded spot. I mean, I needed some time away from work anyways. So I got the weekend off. I packed my bag, cleaned the rifle, and I headed over to my friend's house. We ended up about 25 to 30 miles away from the Canadian border in this forest that seemed to go on forever. I was really digging it because my home state didn't have anything like this. So there were six of us and two dogs. Each person also had a hunting rifle or a shotgun with a handgun, except for me. We parked our cars on this tiny game warden or border patrol dirt road and we ended up hiking about four miles into the woods. By this time, it was already starting to get a little bit dark, so we decided to build a fire to set up tents. Two of the group and one of the dogs went out to gather wood while the rest of us started setting up the tent. It was one of those huge eight person ones. November does get cold up there, so the tent was set up in about 15 minutes. The trio still hadn't returned, but it was getting dark, so we decided to build a fire with branches from around the site. That's when we started hearing crashing noises coming towards us, as if someone was running at us full speed. The two guys came barreling through, with their eyes wide open. The dog was nowhere to be seen. They started talking about seeing one of the other guys acting weird in the woods. So they were trying to approach him, and every time they got close, he would move away. They said that at one point, he disappeared and then popped up not 10 feet behind them. They also mentioned a really bad smell, that of rotten meat and spoiled milk. We tried to ask what was happening, but there was no answer. Then, apparently, the guy took off, sprinting into the woods, and the dog chased after him, barking. The two guys then took off after the dog and the missing guy. They lost both of them pretty soon, and the smell started disappearing as well. They then heard a weird screeching sound in the distance, followed by a loud scream from the dog. Then, they said that the smell came back, and that's when they returned to camp in a hurry. We were all weirded out, but still thought that it was just a prank. I suggested that it might be a joke, and I got yelled at. They then started asking, well, where the hell is the dog then? It was a good point. By this time, the sun was on its way down, so we started building up a fire, and we made sure our motion sensor lights were working and set up the tents. About 15 minutes after dark, the remaining dog started growling aggressively. Then, this weird smell came, and it was making most of us nauseous. We started hearing strange noises, branches cracking, and leaves rustling all around the perimeter of our camp. At this point, the dog was going crazy, and one of the guys with a shotgun, we'll call him Greg, stood up and fired off three rounds of buckshot into the woods. A screech came from the woods, moving away from us at high speed, and the smell also went away. We waited about an hour and decided to try to get some sleep, with two people staying up and standing guard at all times. My turn being the guard came up, along with another guy named Victor. We were outside with the dog, and two hours went by without incident. After us, Greg and Tom took over. I went inside a tent to sleep for a while, and then I woke up to that terrible smell, 
and the sound of Greg yelling. So I got up and went outside. Greg was searching the edge of the woods with a spotlight, calling out Tom's name. I asked what happened, and they explained that they were sitting there when they heard one of the guys from earlier, calling out from the trees. The dog started growling, and Tom rushed off to follow the dog, which had actually gone into the woods. Tom went after the dog, but they lost sight of him. We followed Tom's tracks for a while, but lost him when they just stopped with no other footprints leading back the way he came. That's when we heard Tom's voice calling for help from the woods. However, it was off key and he would burst into giggles now and then. So we started building up the fire again and sat around it with everybody holding lights and all of us holding weapons in hand. About 15 minutes after Tom had disappeared, the smell returned. It returned but it was stronger than ever. We heard gibbering and giggling in the distance and the forest seemed to come alive with strange noises. Suddenly, the voice of Tom came from the woods calling us to come help him but it sounded all wrong and every now and then he would start giggling. So we decided to put the fire out, pack all of our stuff and head back to the vehicles. As we reached the cars, that's when we found the two dogs. One of them was impaled on a snapped pine tree and the other with its neck snapped and twisted around. That's when we heard the giggling again and the smell returned. Stronger than ever, we got into the cars and drove away, not even talking about it. Most of us never even admitted that this happened, but one of the guys later told me that he had seen Tom at the edge of the woods just staring at us as we were leaving with a creepy grin on his face. I actually believe him and I know that I'll never go camping that far away again. I lived alone in this house for the past year and up until now I haven't had any issues. I had first moved into the small town in the middle of the Midwest a year ago after my job had to relocate me. I'm a factory manager and I oversee the daily operations of a newly built factory on the outskirts of town. The moving parts suck but once I was finally moved in I would take a moment to view my surroundings and I was fascinated. I was never much of a nature guy. I spent most of my youth in a major city, but seeing all the towering trees that wrapped around the entire town, like a protection barrier that made me feel safe. The intimidating mountains that formed the backdrop of our town were also very impressive. They gave the horizon character. It was truly a sight to behold. After around 10 months of living here, my company was opening up a new plant and they asked if I could go oversee operations once again. However, this time I declined. I asked if I could stay as the permanent manager of this location. They did mention a slight pay difference, but I didn't mind. Over the past year, everything was perfect. I would wake up at around 6 a.m., do my daily morning ritual, stop by the local cafe, which gave the best coffee on the planet and be at work by 8. My job at the factory was quite simple. I was basically a babysitter. I dealt with discrepancies, did paperwork, checked in with my supervisors, and finally headed home around 6 p.m. My job probably sounds very tedious and boring to a lot of you, but I still enjoyed it. Plus, even with a pay cut, I was still making a pretty decent salary. I'm sure most of you aren't here to listen to me talk about my job or this town. However, at the beginning of last month, I saw something out in my backyard. The way my house is set up, my backyard butts right up to the surrounding tree line that surrounds this town. I had just gotten home from my job and was lying in bed, watching TV until around 10 p.m 
When I finally got ready to go to sleep, I turned off the TV and also my nightstand lamp. I had rolled over and was facing my bedroom window, which pointed directly out into my backyard. It had snowed a few days prior, so my entire backyard had a thin layer of untouched snow. I was staring out the window, letting my mind wander as I was beginning to drift off to a peaceful slumber. When I saw the flash of something near the tree line, seeing whatever it was made my mind refocus itself as I started to scan the trees outside. Not even five minutes later, I saw them. Two eyes were shining in the tree line, reflecting light from some unknown source. They would bob up and down for a moment before stopping and staring at my house. They would then turn to the right or left, disappear for a minute or two, then reappear at a different spot. At first, I thought it must have been a wolf or maybe some other nocturnal creature looking for food. I put it out of my thoughts and fell asleep. For the entire week straight, those eyes had basically become a routine for me as they started to appear every night in the same exact spot. I would lie awake and watch them intently. I thought that maybe perhaps the area in the trees was some sort of natural grazing spot that whatever animal this was had become accustomed to eating here every night. I watched as the eyes walked left to right, disappeared, and reappeared until my tired eyes could no longer stay open. At the end of the first week, something happened. I had just finished turning off the TV and had rolled over to wait for the animal to arrive. A half hour passed and I was just about to go to sleep when the eyes reappeared. The eyes shined brightly in between the dark trees. After a few moments the eyes seemed to get closer to my house. They were faintly growing in the distance. Then, once it crossed into the threshold into my backyard, my motion sensor lights I had set up on the back of my house went off. My eyes shot wide open and I felt my heart rate slowly start to increase. As I saw what was standing in my backyard, it looked like a man, well, almost a man, who was hunched over on all fours like a dog. Its skin was bluish gray and stringy black hair clung to its scalp like the legs of a spider. Its eyes were massive, taking up most of its face. The sudden bright light caused it to raise a hand to shield its eyes. Its fingers were disturbingly long, like bony sticks, hovering over its face. The thing fell back and scrambled into the dark trees. After watching this event unfold, there was no way I was going to go back to bed after that. I got up from my bed and looked around my backyard. A few moments later, the motion sensor lights diminished. I continued scanning the trees for any sign of this creature, but it was gone. I spent the rest of the night trying to find any information I could on what I had seen. I looked around at countless websites, putting the description of what I saw. Most of them spoke of a ghost and demons, but this didn't seem like a demon to me. It looked like a very real thing in my backyard. There's even other websites that mention various creatures that have some similar traits and features as what I saw in my backyard. The following week I watched every window every single night in case it came back. But every single night I was met with nothing. I was starting to think that what I saw wasn't even real. That I had fallen asleep while watching the trees and that my own mind had crafted this vivid nightmare. At the beginning of last week, however, I realized it wasn't a nightmare. It was very real. I was heading to bed a little bit later than I normally would, and as I lay there, I began watching through my window. I wasn't watching as intently as I was from the previous week. Then, after one long blink, it appeared, and this time, I felt my heart thumping in my chest so hard 
that I thought it was going to stop at any moment. I could feel the air beginning to steam my eyes as I hadn't shut them for two minutes straight. The reason I was so unnerved was that the creature was lowering its head from directly above the outside of my window. The roof of my house was still a fair distance from the top of my window. So that meant that this creature was somehow clinging to the outside of my house like a spider on a web. It stared into my window at me. Our eyes were locking in place like if we had some staring contest. I was wondering why my motion sensor lights hadn't gone off at all. But that thought quickly left my mind as I saw the creature reach its hand towards the glass. It began raking its sharp, jagged fingernails along the glass over and over again. The sound that was produced from digging its fingers into the glass. It's embarrassing to admit, but I was scared at this point. Too scared to think and too scared to move. It pulled its hand away from the window and with a quick swing, it shattered the glass into pieces. When it did this, I fell back out of bed and onto the floor. I wanted to get up to run out of there, screaming my head off, but I couldn't seem to take my eyes off this creature. It slithered its way through the broken window and crawled along the inside of my wall. It then stopped once it reached the corner of my bedroom and just stared at me. Its mouth began to crack open as if it hadn't opened its mouth for some time. Broken, sharp rotted teeth filled its mouth as it seemed to smile at me. A slight feeling of disgust began to form within the overwhelming fear that gripped me. In one rapid movement, the creature lunged from the wall of my bedroom over to me. It grabbed at me with its long fingers while its mouth was snapping in my face. I could truly sense that this creature was trying to kill me, or possibly even eat me. The commotion caused the lamp on my nightstand to topple over. I managed to switch it on with one hand, while my other hand held the creature at bay. The sudden light seemed to blind the creature briefly, and in that moment, I brought the lamp crashing down onto its head as hard as I could. It slumped over onto its side, and I shoved it off of me. I quickly got up, left the room, and called the police. I explained that a wild animal or something had broken into my house. They arrived shortly after, and I led them through my house into my bedroom. But when I opened my bedroom door, the creature was gone. They examined my broken window and realized that I was actually telling the truth. Even though when they asked me to describe what kind of animal it was, I stopped myself from telling them that it was a monster. I told them that I was sleeping and that it was too dark for me to see what it was. They nodded and told me to call them if it ever comes back. That was the beginning of last week and I have since repaired my window and made sure that my motion sensor lights are working. I'm not sure what that creature actually was. Maybe some of you out there have more experience with this and can let me know. But as for me, well, I think I'm going to actually contact the higher ups in my company and I'm going to ask them if that new manager position is still available. If it is, then I'll be more than happy to leave this place. When I was a kid, my favorite time of the year had to be winter. There was just something about all the festivities that gave me a sense of wonder. It might sound a little cliche, or possibly a little cringy, but to me as a kid, the holidays felt magical. I would spend my winters watching my family put up all sorts of decorations around the house. Lights, ribbons, and I can't forget about the star attraction, the Christmas tree. My father and I had this tradition. Every year, we would venture out to our local tree farm, and he would let me run around and select our very own Christmas tree. It was one of the few times that my father and I had a chance to bond. He would tell me all these stories about his past, and how his own father would take him. 
Even though my father wasn't one to show emotion, I could tell that these trips to the Christmas tree forest actually meant the world to him. As the years progressed, my love for Christmas kind of diminished. I suppose that's something that just happens over the years. People get old, develop a new interest and responsibilities. During high school, I honestly couldn't care less about Christmas. To me, it was starting to just become another day, another pointless get together with people whom I barely even know or remember. Maybe it was those rebel teenage years, but I just couldn't see the point anymore. That must have been the reason my parents stopped putting so much effort as they used to. Eventually, my father stopped offering to go Christmas tree shopping with me, and the holiday just sort of fell by the wayside. During my senior year in high school is when I met Sarah. She was incredible, and we instantly clicked a few months after meeting. We began dating. Early into our relationship, I realized fairly quickly that her family took Christmas very serious. Every year I was amazed by all the decorations and how much they loved Christmas. It was honestly like something out of a Christmas movie. As time went by, Sarah and I moved in together. We had lived in different apartments over the years until finally we had saved up enough money to buy a house in the suburbs. As the year started drawing to a close, and the winter holidays were fast approaching, I wanted to try and rekindle my old love for Christmas. Once December came around, we went out, and I bought a ton of decorations. We filled up the house from wall to wall, with many different items. Decorations in every size hung in all the windows, and also on the doors. The lights had been strung up around the exterior of the house. It was most likely a bit too much, but I still had fun putting all the decorations up. Sarah and I had talked about what we were going to do about the Christmas tree. She offered to go buy a synthetic one at a store somewhere, but I told her I had a better idea. I explained to her about a weekend that my father used to take me tree shopping, and I told her how it used to be my favorite part of Christmas. Without missing a beat, She asked me when I wanted to go. We made plans to go shopping for one at the end of the week. And I'll be honest, that made me feel happiness I hadn't felt in years. Friday had arrived, and after getting home from work, Sarah asked me if I still wanted to go. I nodded, and with a smile, she grabbed her coat. We headed back out into the winter air and hopped into my truck. We drove four hours trying to find a decent tree farm. A few of them had already sold out, which was quite shocking to me. And other tree farms, well, their selection didn't look too great. After driving for nearly 45 minutes, we found a place. As we pulled into the lodge, the tires of my truck struggled to get any traction in the snow. Our shoes were crunching into the fallen snow, and we walked up to the gate. The trees that stood before us seemed to stretch in every direction. Sitting off to the side was an older man, who seemed to be reading a book by a portable heater. Sarah and I walked over to him, and he struggled to peel his eyes away from his book. In an effort to be funny, I asked him if he had any treats for sale. But the look that he gave me over the edge of his book didn't seem to be amused. With a heavy sigh, he rested his book into his lap and pointed out to the trees. Then he said, find one you like and come let me know and then I'll get it for you. I said thank you and entered through the gate with Sarah following closely behind me. As we entered the forest, we both stared in wonder at all the options. Sarah quickly called me over and asked if this tree would be good. The tree was kind of tall to fit into our house. It was a great tree, but it was too big for the living room. We continued walking looking around for that perfect tree. After a while, I realized I could no longer see the light from the entrance. The shift in the air was chill, and the warm glow of the light bulbs had been replaced by the cold moonlight overhead. Sarah rubbed her arms in an effort to stay warm, and I was beginning to realize that we needed to decide on a tree pretty quickly before one of us freezes out here. Then, 
We saw it. The perfect tree. Only a few yards ahead of us. I grinned as we got closer. But as I was getting closer and closer, I heard Sarah whisper for me to stop. My feet stopped in place and I turned back to look at her to see what was wrong. Sarah was staring off into the distance, her face more pale than I had ever seen before. I asked her what was wrong, but she didn't answer. She just kept staring. I followed her gaze and saw what she was looking at. Between a few trees off in the distance, two eyes were looking right back at us. The shadows cast by the trees around it were obscuring its body, but its eyes seemed to pierce through the darkness. I looked back to Sarah and she managed the whisper, saying that we should leave. I turned back to look at the eyes in the darkness. They were still there, still wide, and still staring directly at us. Then, the eyes began to move out from the trees. As they did, they started to rise higher and higher above the ground. After a few seconds, the eyes were nearly half as tall as the tree it stood next to. It stepped out into the moonlight, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Its body was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It looked like some kind of beast. Dark fur covered it from its head to its toes. Massive clawed hands gripped the tree next to it and I could see the tree strain from the pressure. Large horns were protruding out from its head, curling up and back from its body. It exhaled a deep breath through its nostrils. The gust of warm air visibly obscured its face for a moment. It took another step closer. The twigs beneath its feet were crunching loud as it approached. I could see its face a little bit better now. A dark liquid dripped from its lower jaw staining the pure white snow beneath it. Sarah took a step back, and I could hear a twig snap below her foot. I turned my attention to her and she was nearly crying at this point. The twig snapping was like a trigger. The creature started to roar and this drew my attention back. That's when it started to run at us. But it wasn't running like a fucking animal. It was running like a person. And looking at this, my eyes went wide with panic and I turned to Sarah yelling at her to run. We both began sprinting through the snow, dodging the numerous trees as they passed us by. Even though we were both running as hard as we could, I could still hear that thing's footfalls growing closer and closer to us. Then, the sound of splintering wood echoed from behind us. I turned just in time to see a massive tree falling towards us with immense speed. I called out to Sarah to look out, and she moved away from it when I did the same thing as well. The tree impacted the ground and it shook the earth beneath my feet. I called for Sarah, asking if she was alright. And for a moment, there was no answer. I called again and that's when a response came. I ran around the fallen tree and I found her sitting near another tree. I held out my hand and helped her up. That's when we heard another loud shriek. Coming from deep in the woods, we looked to one another before running out of the forest back into the light of the entrance. The old man looked up from his book and asked us if we found one we liked, but we paid him little mind as we ran out of the fence, hopped into my truck, and drove away. There's quite a bit of few different things in this world that I can't explain. And that night is at the very top of this list. I have no idea what that thing was. Maybe some of you out here have an idea, but I'm at a complete loss. I still love the holidays and Christmas, but this year, I think I'm just gonna buy an artificial Christmas tree, and I would advise all of you to do the same. Stay away from the forest, and be careful when you go in there if you go in there to look for a Christmas tree. I have talked about my road trip on here before. I took the first vacation of my life last year 
a rebuilt Yamaha, and a foolish sense of optimism carry me across the western United States. Being adventurous seriously made me rethink everything I thought I knew about the world. I love Seattle with the hip original hippie neighborhoods and the carnival atmosphere of Pike Place Market. Getting out of Seattle was a total nightmare. Restricted to back roads by a motor that capped at 40 miles an hour, I must have gotten lost a dozen times despite all the help I received from Baffle gas station attendants, so I was behind schedule when it came to finding my campsite. Some miles south and a little east of the city, there's a free campground. It's most often used by horse riders. And boy, can you smell it. That's actually what guided me in the last few miles. There's a gravel road off the service road, and then a few crooked unpaved roads off of that. The trail markers were all bent, broken or faded. In the end, I had to follow my nose. I set up my junior scout tent in the fading twilight. Mine was the only one there. I had the place all to myself. After a quick meal of apples from a previous campground, I did my travel log on my video camera before turning in for the night. I'm not sure how long I slept. I know I checked the time, but I can't recall what it was. Something had disturbed my well-earned beauty rest, but I was too groggy to remember what it was. That's when I sat up, too alert to fall back asleep, but too sleepy to be totally awake. That's when something brushed the side of my tent, and suddenly, I was more awake now than I had ever been. I had done plenty of camping by that point. I was familiar with the sounds of the nighttime critters, from raccoons to coyotes. Nothing had ever bothered me in my tent before. Just snuffle around camp before wandering off and leaving me be. From the sound of the footsteps, it was walking on two legs. My mind immediately jumped to the worst possible conclusion. A bear. There's a lot of conflicting information out there about how to deal with bears and a lot of it depends on the type of bear. Sitting there in the dark with my heart beating in my throat, I had no way of telling what kind I was dealing with. Should I shout out or play dead? I was about 30 yards from a sturdy cement block outhouse that might be better shelter. As quietly as I dared, I slipped my boots on and got ready to dash. The zipper of the tent seemed impossibly loud in the night as I worked it slowly and slowly. After getting it to be fully open, I slowly went outside. Once outside, I craned my neck around to see if the bear if that's what it was, was between me and the outhouse. With the incredible illumination of the Milky Way, I could see the campground clearly all the way to the tree line. There was nothing out there. However, I had this feeling that something was watching me. It was like feeling an insect crawl along the back of my neck. There was no logical way for me to know that something had its eyes on me out there in the dark, in the middle of nowhere. All alone, I couldn't dismiss it. Still on high alert, I crept along and tried not to crunch the gravel under my feet too loud. The outhouse was still my best bet. The door was propped open by a stone, but inside there was a heavy duty boat lock. I would have to spend the night surrounded by the smell of not only horse, but also human poop. But I figured that was a fair trade for not getting killed or eaten. My hand was on the latch. When I heard the awful crunch of footsteps and gravel behind me, I kicked the stone propping the door open out of the way and slammed the heavy metal door shut, no longer caring how much noise I made. Whatever was on the other side had fingers. Something tugged on the door as I struggled to bolt it shut. I won, but it was close. There was a metal mesh along the top of the outhouse for ventilation. Through the top, I could hear the heavy breathing that matched my own. My phone was back in my tent because I'm an idiot. There was no way to tell time. That's when the same stupid impulse that brought me out there in the first place kicked in. I had to No. Hello? Silence. Maybe this person didn't hear me. But then, hello? I could have shit myself. I was in the right place for it. The voice sounded like my own, 
and the sound of it was a kick to the gut. I couldn't even tell you why it made me so uneasy. The sensation was like when you're walking upstairs and you're expecting another step, but your foot comes down on an empty space. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought I was alone, I said. I am alone. Every syllable was off. Hey, I'm sorry, I freaked out. I didn't think there was anyone else out here. Sorry, I'm here. You would think that if I knew it was another camper, I would have opened the door, but I never did. Some deeply buried instinct kept me from taking my hand off the boat. Hey, you scared the crap out of me. Are there more tent sites out in the trees or something? I am something. There are more. The words made me sick to my stomach. Again, I couldn't have even told you why, only that they did. And from its odd speech, I guess English wasn't his first language. Uh, do you need to go? Use the bathroom, I mean? Because I'm going to be in here for a while. That wasn't a lie. I wouldn't even open the door if it was my own mother on the other side. You need to go. Its English was improving with every sentence. There was something weird about that. Hey, look, I'm sorry if I scared you, but you started it by creeping around in the dark. I'm not going to come out. Can you go somewhere else? I'll be gone in the morning, I promise. I just wanted to sleep in peace. You need to be gone. I promise you, I creep in the dark. You won't be here in the morning. Fear closed my mouth shut. The more I spoke, the more he did, and I didn't want to hear his voice anymore. I'm sure that made me sound like a bigot or something, but I had the feeling I was feeding words to him, and the feeling was not pleasant. It felt like he was hungry for them. The same instinct that told me to keep quiet the first time kept me from running my dumb mouth off again. I was dealing with someone who was not mentally well, or was something else. The way he was speaking and the way his words were coming out, and the tone and voice, there was no doubt that he was going to carry out what he was saying. I kept my hands on the boat, while they cramped on the first rays of sun, crept through the mesh at the top of the walls of my shelter. It wasn't until the sun was strong enough to make me sweat in my self-imposed prison that I felt brave, stupid, enough to speak again. Hey, are you still out there? Hello? Anyone? There was no answer, which was the best outcome I could hope for. I opened the door. My tent was untouched, at least from a distance. The oppressive feeling of being watched had dissipated. I dressed and broke down camp in record time. My moped cranked to life, but it wasn't until I went to put my helmet on that I saw the footprint. I had kicked that rock pretty far. It was close to my bike, naturally. I went over to it. I had a no. In a clear outline of fresh mud, there was a single print on the smooth gray of the stone. Not human, but a hoof like that of a horse or goat. It was so fresh, so vivid. It hadn't been there last night when I used the bathroom before I'd gone to bed in the soft mud in front of the outhouse door were more of the same. Some of them on top of my own boot prints. If you want to go looking for whatever the hell it was, be my guest. Just be careful with your words out there. Because I figured out what was wrong with that voice when I watched the playback of my travel log video. It was my own. I'm still freaking the fuck over what happened this last weekend. I think it's still out there. I fucking hope so. This all began a few months ago when I moved here from Eastern Washington to attend the university. I recently turned 21, but I didn't have any friends around to celebrate. So I did the next best thing, rolled a blunt, and ended up watching some stuff on Hulu. I'm living the life here. Recreational weed, undeclared major, living off my savings. And finally, no more parents nagging at my door to do something with my life. Or, at least I thought so. The first time I heard it, 
I thought I was paranoid. I smoke a ton of pot, and living in the new city doesn't help either. People say I live in the party area of downtown. Belltown, I think they call it. It just seems like an endless parade of people and drug street kids skulking at all times of night. And to be honest, it doesn't really bother me that much. I drown that shit out with headphones anyways. I much prefer it to that cold, deafening silence. The silence so strong you start realizing just how bad your situation actually is. A silence that conjures nightmare creatures from the deepest reaches of your mind to explain the occasional noise and the environment of a quiet house. It was in that silence that I heard it. I was grinding some bud for my third bowl of the night when I noticed the empty quiet that filled the space outside of my apartment. I'm on the ground floor, so I'm basically used to all types of screaming, singing, arguing, and fighting when the sun goes down. But not now. Not tonight. There was nothing. It came from the window in my quote-unquote kitchen because it's literally two burners and a mini fridge with a microwave on top. Despite what you know or think about stoner stereotypes, I'm pretty fucking immaculate when it comes to cleaning too. That's why I was puzzled when I investigated the sound. Small amounts of dirt speckle across the small excuse for a counter under the window. The window was closed. I cleaned off the counter and figured I was too high to remember making that mess earlier. Fear was overcome by a wave of relaxation when I hit my pipe. Purple Kush. Family Guy eased me into a coma, and by the morning, I didn't even bother thinking about the noise from the night before. But from then on, it kept happening. Night after night. After night. The same three. Always at different times, too. One o'clock. 245, 137, 340. There wasn't really a pattern to it, just the same weird interval of scratches. It seemed to be getting faster every time. I just started assuming it was someone fucking with me. Maybe some guys picked a place to fuck with every night after they left the bar, and I just happened to get lucky. This explanation would actually help me calm down, and I was eventually convinced that this was all it was. I still didn't have any friends here, and with the cold snap and rain, I didn't really feel like going out and making any yet. The school semester was almost over, and I noticed that I wasn't getting enough sleep. The scratching was getting louder now, and joke or not, I had to get some rest before finals week. One of my classmates suggested going camping. She even offered to let me use her tent and sleeping bag. She said that getting out of the city once in a while and being in nature helps calm the mind. Kinda hippie sounding, but I was stoned when she said it. I took up the offer and made a reservation at the campground. I'm not gonna mention where at, because it might still be down there, waiting for someone. The girl from my class met me at a Starbucks downtown and gave me her camping gear. I really appreciated the kindness, but I'm not sure if my high as fuck monotone voice and glossy red eyes convey any evidence of that. Didn't matter anyways. I packed a couple grams of bud, my pipe, and my old camera. I got inspired by all the Milky Way pictures that people post online. And sleep or not, that was my mission now. The trip out to the park was long. I saw maybe one gas station for 20 miles. And I ate my snacks on the way there. I stopped there to re-up the trail mix and cliff bars and muscle milks before I continue on my way. The clerk looked Native American, kinda old too. He had this weird look in his eyes when I approached him, as if he was about to say something but cut himself off and silently rang up my tasty treats. It was his eyes though that bothered me. He had this look of sympathy and dread and sadness all in one. Maybe I was analyzing the situation too hard, but it seemed like he wanted to tell me something. Whatever though, I had a galaxy to photograph. The campsite was okay. I pitched the tent fast even though some of the poles were missing and didn't snap all the way. I took a hit off my pipe and looked up at the sky, camera in hand ready to snap that winning Milky Way shot. Clouds. 
Nothing but a fucking gray sky. Too tired to drive. I got in the tent and listened to a podcast from my phone speakers. I don't remember when I fell asleep, but I did. Eventually. And then, I woke up. It was scratching at the fucking tent. Get the fuck off my tent, douchebags. And again, I was met with that cold silence. No one responded. I was somewhat paralyzed from fear. But in that brief moment, I checked my phone to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I refreshed the news app and saw it update in real time. Kind of a dumb way to check that everything is okay. But I guess it doesn't matter when... All around the tent, I heard it scratching and scratching to a point where I thought I was just going insane. My heart pounded out of my chest. And my anxiety was at the highest point it's ever been my entire life. Each passing moment of silence felt like another calm to a storm of horror. The scratching in my imagination. I couldn't get out of the tent. I couldn't speak. I waited and waited. It continued, scratching faster and faster and suddenly, I heard something. My tent. My. The way it spoke, definitely not normal sounding for a person. The fact I was even questioning the humanity in its voice was reason enough to piss myself, which I did. For a grown ass man, I was on the verge of tears. This was too much. I grabbed my car keys and phone and weed and unzipped the front flap. I bolted to the car, not looking back as I ran. The keys fumble around the lock and I could hear something behind me, turning. It sounded huge, but it sounded like it was on two feet. The key slid in, and that's when I remember I had a clicker. It was in this moment of dumb realization. I got the ignition started, turned the high beams on and reversed out of my spot to hightail it out of the camp. Nothing in front of me. I peeked the rear view mirror before hitting the gas only to see two long hair covered legs lit up by my brake lights making giant strides towards my rear window I stomped on the pedal whatever it was trying to catch up to me but it gave up after I approached about 60 miles per hour the drive back was a relief and a part of me still could not believe what happened when I got home it was already morning the sun was up and I could see people staggering back from bars and nightclubs it was a moment of relief I felt a little back to normal until I got out of the car to get the supplies. Huge gashes were scratched into the window and door and my tailpipe was slightly bent. At least I'm not crazy, I thought. I lifted up the rear hatch and that's when I realized I forgot that I abandoned that girl's camping gear out in the campsite. My stomach dropped. There's no way she would believe my story. But that's when I noticed something else in the back seat of my car. Dirt. Small amounts of it speckle across the floor and seats. I'm writing this from home and as an update, it's 4.53 p.m. And I just want to let y'all know, it's back. I'm writing this to warn you, or to educate you. I haven't decided yet, but you need to understand something. I don't know what I saw, but I do know that I never want to see it again. And I'm warning you, don't go out looking for it. I live and go to college in a small mountain town in Colorado, but often go home to see family as most of them live in Texas and I'm actually attached to visiting my cat. Now, in order to get home, I have to make most of my drive through New Mexico, through Santa Fe, and about 160 miles through the desert, which if you aren't familiar with, don't try to get acquainted with it, or if you're planning to go out there. 
I hope this story will change your mind. On this drive, I had three other people with me. My younger sister Andrea and two friends from school, Jess and Katie. It was our spring break and instead of buying stupid price plane tickets, we decided to pile into my little Mercury vehicle and book it back to Texas. Unfortunately, we left the valley a little later than we were supposed to because someone, which was actually me, was forgetting their wallet. So by the time we hit the stretch of desert, it was close to 1 a.m. It had been raining since before we headed through Santa Fe. Not super heavy, but heavy enough. It was 65 degrees. I do remember that because it had been in negatives for quite a while because of where I go to school. So I was pleased to see something over five degrees. For this next part of the story, I need you to understand something. I hadn't been driving that long. I was actually awake. I didn't hallucinate and I damn sure wasn't the only one who saw it. So please, believe me. We passed a white Prius. As he was driving away, I looked in my rear view mirror and saw something crossing the road. Caught in the red glow of the tail lights, it was walking with a horrible limp and dragging itself across the road on two legs. The motions were unnatural, even jerky. I slammed on my brakes, thinking someone had driven off the road and was stuck or injured. I slid to a stop about 20 feet away from it. The Prius had stopped as well, seeing the person in the road. I opened my door and stuck my head out in the rain to get a better view. It was inhuman. It stopped. The figure was illuminated by the taillights of both of our vehicles. It had to have been at least 7 feet tall, possibly 8. The skin was stretched like a too small shirt, cracking, hanging off its frame in long bloody ribbons. The jaw was almost totally unhinged from its face, the cheekbones disgusting. The skin on the scalp was thin and spots of bloody white stuck out. And the smell. I had never smelled anything like it. As soon as I opened the door it hit me. Rotting flesh. Meat that has been left out for months. Rotten milk. The kind of stuff nightmares are made of. The Prius took off, squealing its tires into the night. But I stayed. Fight or flight hadn't kicked in yet for me. This thing couldn't have been more than 20 feet away. It slowly turned its head. Each vertebrate in the neck individually cracking like fucking bubble wrap. We made eye contact. But it had no eyes. Only darkness. I slammed my car door shut and sped off. At this point my friends all woke up and saw it too. Katie was in the back and hysterical. Jess was silent. Her mouth set into a grim. Andrea just sat with a look of fear. Tears silently streaming down her face. My friend kept screaming. What the fuck was that? What the fuck was that, Alex? I didn't know what to tell her. I just kept driving. My hands gripping the wheel as we broke 80. Then something happened that I still, to this day, cannot explain. The temperature dropped during the whole event. It was 30 degrees out. It had been 65 no more than 5 minutes ago. It then began to snow, heavy, wet snow. We ended up pulling over at a gas station called Klein's Corner. No one moved. Andrea was crying and Jess was praying. Kate was cursing and I was shaking. What the fuck just happened? Kate said. All color drained from her face. I looked at her. My face with fear. I don't know. I don't want to know. But we need to leave. I slowly put the car into drive and continue our trip. I don't remember the rest of the drive. All I know is that everything else was fine. We reached Texas by 6 a.m. Nothing else happened. I'm not sure what it was. The closest I could come to was a skinwalker. Maybe it was a shapeshifter. That had a bad change. I really don't know. Please believe me when I tell you this. I'm not crazy. I know what I saw. Don't go looking for it. Don't follow it. Because it might end up following you back.
I experienced something in the summer of 2013 that still haunts me to this day and continues to make me question everything. My girlfriend Anna and I had decided to go camping as a last farewell to summer and to get some alone time. She would be going back to school pretty soon and I wouldn't be seeing her as often. We had been together for just over two years and I was completely head over heels for her. I was even thinking about popping the question. So on a weekend in early August, I packed up my camping gear and drove 45 minutes away to the park that we would always visit. It was a nice park. It had a lot of trees and wildlife along with a small creek running through it. We knew the area well since my friends and family had camped there since we were kids. I ended up sending a text message to Anna after parking my car, letting her know that I had made it and I had set up camp in our favorite spot. You see, Anna had been caring for her sick grandmother all summer and her sister had finally agreed to watch her so that she could get away for the weekend, but she had to wait for her sister to get off work, around 5 p.m. that is. To save time, I had volunteered to go ahead and set up. I went up the trail a bit until I found the spot we always camped at. It was nice and level and was right beside the creek. I immediately started setting up the tent. I wanted to get everything done so Anna didn't have to help. About 40 minutes later, I had the tent set up, our camping gear set out, and our sleeping bags unrolled. Everything was organized and cozy. I was in the middle of starting a fire when I got a notification on my phone. It was a text message from Anna. I have something to tell you, it read. Just as I started to text her back, I heard footsteps coming down the path. My body tensed up a bit because you never know what kind of people you'll run into in these woods. We had on a number of occasions met with a few drunks and the occasional rowdy teenager, but I soon relaxed as I saw Anna step out from behind the trees with a big grin on her face. I walked up and hugged her, scooping her off the ground a bit to make her giggle. I sat her back down and asked her what she had wanted to tell me. I love you, was the reply that I got as she planted a kiss on my cheek. Her voice though, sounded a bit different and her lips were cold. I asked if she was feeling okay and she brushed off the question and went to check out the camp. I gave her a brief tour before I went to go cook dinner. I made us each one of those pre-packaged camping meals that you add hot water to. We had pasta and I opened a bottle of red wine I had brought. We sat around the fire eating. I tried my best to entertain her with some funny stories. The sun was going down and I was having a great time. I watched the shadows dance off of her and the surrounding trees and listened to the motion of the nearby creek. The daylight was almost gone when she said she was cold. I told her she could go into the tent to warm up while I cleaned up from dinner. She made her way to the tent but not before giving me a smile and another cold kiss. I was starting to get worried about her. I wondered if she was getting sick but I didn't want to nag her so I didn't say anything. I busied myself with cleaning up after dinner and it was there that I found Anna's plate of food that she had set off to the side on the ground. She hadn't ate a single thing. I also found her glass of wine nearby, tipped over into the grass. This wasn't like her at all. That girl liked her food and the wine was her favorite. At this point, I was more than just a little worried. So I headed into the tent to ask her if she was feeling sick and I suggested that we pack up and get a motel for the night. But when I opened the tent and crawled in, I found her sound asleep in her sleeping bag. I contemplated waking her up so we could leave, but she looked so relaxed that I decided against it. I went back outside and finished cleaning up camp and putting out the fire before I lay down next to her in my own sleeping bag. I had a bit too much wine and I fell asleep quickly. The morning came and it quickly filled the tent with a soft glow as I listened to the birds singing outside. Anna was still sound asleep, so I decided to get up and start breakfast. Fifteen minutes later, I was admiring the meal that I had made. Well, as much as you can admire, 
slightly runny scrambled eggs that came from a pouch. I peeked my head back into the tent to tell Anna that breakfast was ready, but that's when things got even stranger. Anna wasn't there. I didn't think it was likely that she could have left the tent without me seeing her, but maybe she had done so when my back was turned. I waited for a bit figuring that she stepped out when, quote unquote, nature called, but 15 minutes passed and I was starting to get worried. I walked the edge of our campsite and called for her, but there was no response. I walked to the trail and called out her name as I walked up and down the path each way. Still, nothing. I went back to the campsite and checked the tent, but it was still empty. I looked around her belongings, but it was then that I realized that she hadn't brought anything. I couldn't even remember her checking her phone last night, which is something that she was in the habit of doing while she was out in case her grandma needed her. That's when I grabbed my phone and decided to text her. I didn't have any signal, so I walked back up the trail to my truck where I knew the signal was good. That's when the text messages started flooding my screen. All of them, from Anna, my hands began to shake as I started reading. I have, I have something, something to tell you. Me. It's bad news. Grandma just passed away. Are you there? Can you meet me at Grandma's house? I can't go camping tonight. I'm sorry. We can reschedule. Where are you? Fine. I'll be at my sister's house for the night. Call me. My hand started to shake so violently that I dropped my phone. My mind raced so fast that I had a fight to not pass out. I ran back to the campsite and searched everywhere, but there was no evidence of Anna or anyone else. I checked the tent to look at her sleeping bag that had clearly been used last night. I even checked the garbage bag to confirm that there were two plates from dinner last night, one with food still on it. I ran back to the truck and sent Anna a text message because I didn't trust my voice not to tremble. I told her I got very sick last night and couldn't text her back. I apologized and offered my condolences about the passing of her grandma. She texted me back letting me know she was okay and that I would see her later that day. I walked back to camp in a daze. My mind seemed to want to shut down. It couldn't process what happened. At first I thought I was going crazy. I thought I had a breakdown and imagined it all. But the sleeping bag and the dinner that she didn't eat told me differently. Who or what kept me company last night? Who or what could look just like Anna but not be Anna? Had it been a ghost? Maybe a shapeshifter? Or was all of this just some kind of sick joke? I packed up camp with difficulty. My stomach was in knots and my muscles were weak. I felt like I was going to get sick at any moment. I made it home and sent a text message to Anna. I told her I was still sick and didn't want to make her sick. The next time I saw Anna was on the day of her grandma's funeral, where I easily passed off my anxiety about the whole ordeal as grief and sympathy. As I said in the beginning, I never told anyone the story. Me and Anna are now married and I still haven't even told her. We don't go camping in those woods anymore. We have found a much nicer and hopefully safer spot to camp. I look back and remember that night quite often. I replay all the scenes in my head, trying to find anything that will lead me to an explanation, but I haven't figured out anything. I do, however, know one thing. I spent the night with someone, or something, and it wasn't my girlfriend. For context, my tribe is the Kickapoo tribe. We're spread out through Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and Mexico. I have family everywhere, but I live in Oklahoma. Our tribe still practices traditional ceremonies. That is to say it's all old school, outsiders are not welcome, and nothing is written down. And we have several tribal members who don't even speak the English language, or know anything about what's going on around the world. Anyways, 
When I was young, there was a ceremony that had to take place in Mexico every year. All families essentially have to make a trip down there. Out of respect for my tribe, I won't include exactly what happens, but it shouldn't matter. All that you need to know is my grandmother has a house down there that my relatives go to. There is a lot of us, more than the house can hold. Lucky for us, it's cheap to build over there. So my grandmother had a smaller house on that property. My family, my aunt's family, and my uncle's family were there. My grandmother is a superhero, so she is helping another group of family with their ceremony. Since the knowledge is all word of mouth, and so my mom would take care of our ceremony. The entire res in Mexico is located in the middle of nowhere, about four hours drive from Eagle Pass. And once you get there, it's another two hours until you get to the property. It's really big, and there are mountains within walking distance. My grandmother's house are actually at the foot of one. There's no good stories that involve those mountains. It's actually considered a very taboo place. We don't go up there except to hunt. And also, a ceremony must be done for your protection if you have to go. I was maybe eight or nine at the time. My aunt lives in Texas, and my sisters and I don't get a chance to see our cousins very much. So these trips were the closest thing we had to family vacations, even though they were nothing but long work days. There is no electricity over there. As someone who grew up in pretty close to Oklahoma City, I sometimes forget how dark it can be when there are no cities nearby. No lights on the horizon, no cars on the road. Just finding the two small houses on the land can be difficult if no one has any fires going. There is a window in each room that is barred and the doors are made of steel. It's not pretty but it's necessary since no one lives in these houses most of the year. The new house is different. The windows are still barred, but they can open. The old house windows were just solid glass. My sisters and I were playing with my cousin E and M in the new house. M happens to be my age and E is two years younger. It was well after sundown and the headlights on my uncle's truck was the only light. It was getting late and we, I say we but really just the parents, had a long day of work the next day. So everyone started moving for lights out. My family was in the old house so my sisters and I headed to our room and this event happened that night. I woke up to screaming, so did everyone else. You would think I would have been panicked, but no. I was a kid who had just woken up by what was the sound of E screaming in the house. I wanted to scream at him to be quiet. I wasn't scared until my dad walked into our room and told us to stay. We don't disobey my dad, so that's what we did. We went to the window and tried to watch outside. My dad was talking to my auntie and my uncle along with some of my older cousins. We're walking up and down the fence on our property with flashlights. It was too dark to see anything else. After an hour or so, we started getting tired so we went back to sleep. But the adults were awake until sunrise. I tracked E and M down to try to find out what happened. But E wouldn't talk about it and M didn't know. He said that E saw something through the window. And that's when we all got a little creeped out. On the last day I asked my cousin G. G was one of the cousins who was walking up and down the fence that night. And as a kid he was something of a hero to me. He was a genuine tall muscle badass native. He told me what happened since my sisters weren't around. Apparently it was hot in the new house so my cousins had opened all the windows. E was sleeping on the floor next to one and woke up because of something touching his face. Apparently, an old pale naked woman was sticking her head through the bars and was looking down at him. Her hair was long and gray, and this touching his face is what made him wake up. He screamed and screamed until everyone came. After that, they looked around but never found anything. I was creeped out, 
but was pretty sure that E had just had a bad dream. So here I am a few years later. I haven't gone back to Mexico or Texas in a long time. I'm not really involved in the traditional part of my tribe anymore. My sisters have kind of taken over now. I still help when I can, but I have a pretty busy job. I discovered this community a few weeks ago, and I thought about what happened with E way back, so I thought it might make a good story here. Just out of curiosity, I called my mom to ask about it. Surely I wasn't the only one who had thought E had just had a bad dream. Why was everyone taking him so serious? I really wish I had him because now I have this feeling in my stomach when I think about it. She told me, this wasn't the first time the old woman had been seen. And G was wrong. They found her bare footprints going from the window to the fence, headed towards the mountains. Judging from the footprints they found, she had visited every window on the land. And mind you, it's in the middle of nowhere. In the pitch black. What the fuck? I live right next to the Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek, and it only takes about 25 to 30 minutes. I have made this trip dozens of times, and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way, so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest, however, about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. This day, I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was 10 steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound, the one that screams there is definitely someone or something there with you. I froze, not sure what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back to my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation, so I whispered, hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips, I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back and the sound of my voice. Hello? My heart pounded against my chest. I felt like I was going to faint. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. I couldn't reply. Hello? 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 As my voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? 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 It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale. And I realized, for the first time, that there was no typical forest sound. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets. Nothing. I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. I had enough and was wheeling my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard some rustling in the bushes 20 feet to my left. I watched as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush. As it came further out, 
and stood up on twos. I took off. I flew out of the woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, lay down, and thought about what happened. My mom came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied yes, I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I guess I was afraid of how she would react. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. But this terrified me even more. He said to call him the next morning and he would explain more and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 a.m., just as I was about to drift off, the air changed. The night sounds got quiet. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers over my head like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it! It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then, it did something new. It called my name. Amy. My mother's voice. Amy. Amy. Come here. Hello? Stop it. My voice again. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up around 12 to my friend calling to tell me he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what happened to me. He said there was a creature that they call Yi Naudroshi, or he who goes on all fours, or a skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required, and that this witch had caught my scent and knew me now. I was also given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me, and that I would always have to be careful. Last night, I heard scratching on my window, then a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point, it started calling my name, but drawing it out really far, like Amy. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the door and let it into my house. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is this thing seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can take that. I saw some videos about skinwalkers on TikTok. So I started watching videos about them on YouTube. And there was a whole podcast where this guy just read stories about them from Reddit and other stories that people submitted. Our ward at church purchased a piece of land way back in the day. It's seriously just wooded area with a little bit of swamp. We would always go there for campouts and scouts. And at night, when it was pitch black, we would all play manhunt. Well, one time, we all got down to one person whose name was David. Growing up, he was super fast, and he would hide really good so nobody could ever find him. 
he would always end up being the last person. Well, one time, it was down to David, and we had split up and gone way deep in the forest towards the swamp because it seems like it was impossible to find him. We thought he might have gone a little bit further than we normally go. We started getting into some more muddy and wet terrain as we get closer to a swamp-like area where the water is most likely shin deep. And we saw David way out in the swamp and he wasn't wearing a shirt. And with the spotlight on him, he looked super pale. But he just stood there and didn't say a word. You could seriously tell something was off. Then, all of a sudden, we heard David from behind us, yelling, trying to get our attention, so we would keep trying to chase him down. Meaning, what we saw in front of us was definitely not him. So being a bunch of 12 to 17 year old boys, we started yelling and running back to the campsite as fast as we could. Nobody believed us. In fact, for years everybody made fun of it, calling the ghost of David. But then I started listening to these stories and every single one of them sounds just like what happened in some way or another. I am Navajo. We had an incident with an unwelcome visitor in our home. Here's what happened. My cousin is sleeping over. He's the same age as me. We're both 13 at this time. We're in my room talking and hanging out. It is around maybe 11 p.m. It is a pleasant summer evening. So my window is wide open. It's also pretty dark outside, and my dad is in the living room watching TV. But as always, he's dozed off on the couch. My mom has already gone to bed. My cousin and I are keeping it down, but we're not ready yet to call it a night. All of a sudden, we hear the screen door to the front of the house open and slam shut. We think it's my dad. My mom. She tells us the next day she hears footsteps on the carpet. Whoever it is, she says, goes through her room and towards the bathroom. So she naturally assumes it's my dad. Then she realizes that she's unable to move, as if she's paralyzed. Still, in my room, my cousin and I again hear the screen door open and slam. Only this time more loud. It wakes up my dad and he comes to my bedroom to check on us. Finding us both there, he wants to know which one of my friends just slipped out of the house. It takes a few minutes, but we convince him we were by ourselves and that we thought it was him going in and out. I can see by the look on his face, he's not really buying it, but he has to admit we don't seem to be lying. He then leaves And as he's closing the door to my room, he tells us to stay out of trouble and go to sleep. All we could do is shrug. The next morning, my mom tells us about what she heard and how she could not move. She also tells us that the second time the door slams, she then hears what sounds like a horse galloping by her bedroom window. She then has all of us pray, and now, every year, We hike up the mountain to a high point and we pray for protection from evil. This event happened just south of Polaca, Arizona within the Navajo Reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say, an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which 
was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons, and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. One of the sons, not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape materializing from the darkness itself loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath and some of it was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later on his knees, holding the sides of his head, and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limped and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house and they summoned the local medicine man who came and said some prayers over him, but he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust, traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and blessed the Hogan. Later, after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog-faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body. I was only 17 at the time. On this specific night, I woke up feeling thirsty. I'm just lying there, staring into the dark and deciding if it's worth the effort to get up and get something to drink. I'm sure we all been in that situation plenty of times before. So tonight, when you're in bed and you're questioning if you should get up and get some water, remember this story. So all I can hear is the clock ticking down the hallway and the muted silence. It's just way too quiet. I check the time on my cell phone. It's a few minutes short of 2.30 a.m. I then decide to sit up and get out the bed. I then make my way towards the door of my bedroom. It's really dark. I go down the hallway towards the kitchen. As I get out to the living room, I chance to look to my right and in the direction of the front door to the house. The only light is coming from a street light that is down at the end of the property and not all that far away. There, at the inside of the door, inside the house, I see this figure standing there. Its face at first appears human, then serpent-like and then back to human, as if it can't decide how it wants to present itself to me. For some reason, I'm just standing there taking this all in. I'm not afraid, but I don't feel like I have any control over my senses either. And I'm not sure if I could move or have said anything, even if I wanted to, which at the time, I can't say I did. As the two of us are standing face to face, he assumes his human features. His face is fully painted, a thick stripe of black across his eyes and the rest white. He has a feather woven into the hair at the top of his head. He looks young 
not much older than me. He is bare chested, not real muscular, but definitely cut. His torso is painted red. His lower half is covering what looks to be khaki color pants, well worn and faded, cut off and frayed just below the knees. He is barefooted, but his wrists and ankles are wrapped with animal skin of some sort. It is hairy and light, colored like that of a coyote. He doesn't say anything to me, not aloud anyway, but I do hear his words in my head. Although for the life of me, I can't remember any of it. It's as if he at the same time, with this cold stare of his, is pinching away layers of my memory. I do remember wondering why he is in my house and having the idea that he was expecting to find someone else. Just then, without even thinking about it, my cell phone in my hand, I begin dialing 911. With the phone ringing, I look back to the painted stranger. He gives me a thin smile and vanishes through the door, which by the way is closed and locked. To the other side, I hear what sounds like a horse galloping away. I move over to the door and pull it open. I see this figure taking long strides across my yard, away from the light and out into the street. There's a car parked on the other side. He goes around to the passenger side, ducks down and into the car, and it drives off. It all happens in a matter of seconds. I then realize there's a police operator talking back to me from the phone. I tell her there was someone in my house, but I leave out the part about his changing appearance and leaving through a closed door. The operator, or whoever she was, tells me not to worry about it. She says that I'm not the first caller of this kind on this night. She tells me to say a prayer, telling me that she too is Navajo and to go back to bed and that I won't be bothered by it anymore. Before I begin, I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my gammy and gampy at the end of my school years. I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course, the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes, and it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, 
making the fox finally make a noise, mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by, it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong, even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me Sugar Booger. That being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I had heard. But it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Sugar Booger. I looked up where I heard it coming from which was from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe, and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later, it was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side trying to fall back asleep until I heard sugar booger. My eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken, but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then, I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there, frozen in fear. 
I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes, but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment, I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket, that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hooked the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw, that if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again, but this time it was my actual name. Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes where we heard it, then to me. She then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well, and since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something, but I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something, a red fox, sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes, the same red fox for my dream somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas, them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods, no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains. 
making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old. Her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful. I could have stayed there, but as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at that time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it. But now they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was too scared to even blink. Then I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused, 
since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would happen if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw. And then they started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions, and that's what really scares me. Now, I have long moved from California, and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else, and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, please help me. Alex, Jim, and I decided to go camping. We set up camp, decided to just drink and talk, and that's what we did all night. About anything and everything that came to mind. It was 3 a.m. and we were still chatting away until we heard something in the trees. Some kind of cracking sound. Could be a bird, said Jim. A big damn bird, I replied with slight confusion. Could be a monkey, joked Alex. We shared the laugh and ignored the sound and continued to talk. Another half hour had passed and the sound had completely stopped. I wonder what that was anyway, Alex said. Well, I have no clue, I replied, taking a sip of my beer. Well. I hope it's gone, because I need a piss, Jim said, standing up and heading to the trees. A few minutes passed, and Alex and I grew concerned. We best go look for him, said Alex. He sounded a little annoyed. We stood up and walked in the direction Jim went. It didn't take long to find the first drop of blood and then the trail that led deeper into the woods what the fuck i said shaking we began shouting for him following the trail i was the first to see him standing in a clearing about 10 meters away he was facing away from us we tried shouting but we got no response We walked closer and we noticed him twitching violently. He was covered in blood 
and clearly beat up. I was about to say his name once again, but the word got stuck in my throat when I saw the bloody pile of meat on the floor next to him. I think Alex saw it too, as he also went silent. As if by magic, Jim turned to us, and we saw his face was literally hanging off, and underneath was pale, gray skin. We could also see a burning orange eye, and part of a wide mouth with long, sharp teeth where the skin was peeled off. Besides from this, Jim looked normal, aside from a few cuts and bruises. As we stared into the single orange eye, the thing wearing Jim's skin pushed the peeling flesh back on, and there, Jim stood totally normal. Hey guys, let's go for a walk, he said in his normal voice. This thing also seemed to demonstrate excitement. Alex and I turned. We ran past our campsite and got straight in the car, parked about a mile from our tent. I'm not sure if this Jim followed us. I swear I could hear thumping footsteps behind Alex and I. We reached the car and jumped in, pouring sweat and heaving. I started the car faster than ever before and drove at nearly 100 miles per hour all the way back home. When we arrived and got out, I walked around the back of the car only to see scratch marks on the bumper. I shivered as I realized how close he must have been. This was over 40 years ago. Alex never quite recovered, and last I heard, he was living in a mental hospital. I was thinking I may have to join him, as I'm pretty sure I saw Jim a few weeks ago at a bar. I thought I was mad until I did some research. I would have done it sooner, but I'm an old man now, and we didn't have Google back in the day. I'm pretty sure we encountered a skinwalker, and it may have found me after 40 years, and I think it wants to finish the job. And now it's pretty strange that I keep getting letters asking to catch up from my old friend Jim.